Uh, so uh, tonight, uh, according to Johnson's paper, the theme is Bridget Solidarity with the Poor and on Fire for Justice. Okay. Um, and as usual, it's in two parts. Uh, early on, when I came in, I put in the questions uh, for the group work discussion. Uh, it'll be the same format as usual. Uh, so I, I'll just make a start. Bridget is one of the three patron saints of Ireland and perhaps the most popular and loved. Until the 1st of February 2022, only Patrick had a public holiday. Last year, Secular Ireland created another public holiday named after a saint, and the 1st of February is now St Bridget's Day. It always was, or has been for a long time, but now it's a public holiday. The interesting thing about the 1st of February 2022 was how both secular and religious Ireland enthusiastically embraced Bridget and the public holiday. Both were right in a way, because we can't be absolutely sure if she existed. There may not have been an historical Bridget, but let's have a public holiday anyway. Historically, what we can say with some certainty is that there was in the far distant mists of Ireland a goddess probably called Bridget. The goddess Bridget had huge significance in pre-Christian Ireland. The goddess may have been an Irish manifestation of the Celtic goddess Brigantia. We've no real historical evidence for a Christian Bridget, but we have lots of evidence of a Christian Bridget cult. It seems that the cult of a goddess developed into a cult of a Christian. A Bridget was interwoven with early myth and Irish folklore. In the Bridget story, we have a synthesis of pre-Christian religion and Christianity. There are three lives of Bridget, which date from the seventh to the ninth centuries, which is long after Bridget is reputed to have lived. Her dates are given as 450 to 524 CE. The first and best known life is by Cogitosis, written somewhere between 650 and 675 CE. At earliest, Cogitosis' life of Bridget is written just over 100 years after, Brid after Bridget is reputed to have died. What Cogitosis wrote was extensive being one of the most extensive lives of Irish saints. But the three lives of Bridget belong to a genre of literature known as hagiography. The hagiographers are not historically based documents. Sorry, the hagiographies are not historically based documents. The lives of Bridget were primarily concerned with Bridget's way of life rather than her life as such. Lives focus on saintliness or holiness of life and miracles as evidence of a holy life. There may be little whiff of historical or biographical information, but the hagiographies or lives are providing the faith community with good examples of a life lived for and with God. Historically, as we know history, is not important. The lives Sorry, the writers of lives are not interested in biography as we know it. Cogitosis may even have written his life of Bridget as propaganda and a piece of political power play. In the seventh century, there is a power struggle going on between Armagh and Kildare as to which centre will have the primacy in the Irish church. There were people in Armagh writing lives of Patrick at that time which have no historical basis. But this is about primacy and ecclesial power. And as we know now, Armagh won the day and is still the seat of primacy for both the Catholic Church and the Church of Ireland. The Book of Armagh has a story of Patrick and Bridget actually meeting and finding a unity of mind and heart. Some Armagh monks made that up because Patrick and Bridget lived at different times, if Bridget lived at all. Cogitosis is also setting before his contemporary faith community a model of holy living. 
He has synthesized pre-Christian mythology with Christian story. Early monks, like Cogitosis, had no difficulty with mythology. They knew that truth is more than historical, literal, or factual. The language of symbols, poetry, metaphor, and myth is needed to describe mystery and a myth about a goddess and stories of Jesus to present a powerful example and model of the God-shaped life. There may well have been an historical Bridget, but what we have is a theological life, or if you like, a profound theomyth of a saintly woman. The goddess Bridget and the saint Bridget have flames coming from their head. The image or symbolism of fire is an example of how pre-Christian and Christian motifs overlap. Alton's hymn, a 7th century composition, and perhaps one of the earliest hymns in the Irish language, uses a variety of metaphors from pre-Christian and Christian Ireland to model Bridget. Quote, Bridget, woman ever excellent, golden, radiant flame, lead us to the eternal kingdom, the bright, dazzling sun. Cogitosis also blends metaphor and image as he hymns Bridget. She is Mary of the Gales, foster mother of Christ and Mary's midwife. This is creative imagination, not history. Bridget was not present as midwife at the birth of Christ. It is not surprising that the powerful Christian cult of Bridget developed in Ireland the Church of the Oak. Pre-Christian Kildare was already known as the city of Bridget, the goddess. The ritual burning of fire, a pre-Christian ritual, becomes associated with Kildare. In the grounds of the present Church of Ireland Cathedral in Kildare, you can see a very old fire pit. Catholic and Protestant churches in Ireland are named after St. Bridget, in 1807, an order of nuns, the Brigidines, were founded in her honour, and Johnson had the privilege of giving a lecture a few years ago at the Brigidine community in Kildare. The corpus of Bridget also travelled. The Celtic missionaries took the story to Europe in the 7th to the 9th centuries. The cult of Bridget travelled to England, Scotland and Wales. Bridget arrived in Brittany, northern and eastern France the Low County countries, Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and Northern Italy. In Brittany, Bridget has 30 churches and chapel dedications. And is venerated as midwife to Mary and protectress of cattle. Is still venerated in Bruges. In the Cologne Diocese, Bridget has four parish churches and seven chapels dedicated to her. The cult of Bridget arrived in northern Italy in the 9th century. Whether Bridget the saint existed or not, the cult or story has inspired spirituality and concerns for justice and solidarity with the poor. Now Ireland has a public holiday recognising her, with some celebrating the goddess, and others the Christian saint. Either way, the 1st of February has become a symbol of woman's dignity and liberation from patriarchy, misogyny, and male domination. This is liberation and justice. In 2024, we mark the 1,500th anniversary of her birth. Whether that is historical or not doesn't matter. There is much in 2024 to mark and celebrate with Bridget. Let's use our creative imaginations. So that's the end of the first part of Johnson's paper. Um, I discussed two questions with him, which I've actually put in at the very beginning of the chat function. Uh, I'll just read them out to you. The first one, we have no historical evidence Bridget existed or not. 
as the various accounts of our life are couched in mythic language. But does it actually matter? In other words, does it matter whether Bridget was historical or theomythical? The second question, the Amerindians have a saying, it may not have happened this way, but it is true. How do we understand myth and how important is the language of myth to our comprehension of truth? So why did Cogitosis and others write and use the language of myth? And why myth? How important is myth to our understanding and comprehension of truth? So two questions to grapple with in your groups. Um, I know Loretto usually puts you into groups. Um, you have 20 minutes. And when we come back, uh, we'll have some um, feedback and conversations around around what you shared. Is that is that okay? That's great, Cathy. Thank you very much. Happy I'm, enough. I'll open the groups now. Thanks a million. Okay. Thanks. Thank you to Anne and and also to Bridget uh, Watson for for her, her uh, explanations. Those are uh, really insightful. Uh, so this this is the second part of Johnson's paper. And he's called it Bridget a model of compassion and justice. So Cogitosis in his life of Bridget provides us not with historical biography, but with a theomythical and ethical portrait of a god intoxicated woman. I think that's a wonderful phrase, a god intoxicated woman. Three large themes stand out, and, and Bridget Watson has already anticipated them. Firstly, Bridget's act of compassion for the poor. Kildare is reputed to have been the city of the poor. Such was its reputation for engagement and solidarity with the poor, of whom there were many. The major theme in Cogitosis' life is compassion. 33 of 32 chapters, sorry, 23 of 32 chapters in the life of Bridget deal with Bridget's concern for friends and strangers the marginalized and guests, including lepers. And leprosy was a widespread disease in Ireland at the time. This was when Cogitosis was writing. Her giving to these seeking food and material help was generous. The poor and strangers were drawn from every quarter by her reputation for kindness and generosity. Kildare was also described as the safest place of refuge in Ireland, a safe place for fugitives fleeing from violence and oppression. Cogitosis used a biblical story from John's gospel about Jesus turning water into wine. He gave it an Irish cultural twist. Bridget, the Christ follower, turns water into the best beer in response to lepers. Lepers were social outcasts and the most avoided and dreaded people at the time. The key virtue or ethical value in Bridget's life, as told by Cogitosis, is compassion, as she responds to the poor, the fugitives and the untouchables. This is what it means to live the God life and to be a Christ person, to be a compassionate person. There's nothing pious about holy living in the Celtic way. It's about being in solidarity in practical ways with the poor, the suffering and the marginal. So it's living out the compassion. Not only does the life reflect the Jesus story and the prefer preferential option for the poor and marginalised, it's a reminder that active compassion is tenacious solidarity with the nobodies, and also a reminder that religious worship, prayer and social justice are indivisible. In other words, there's no point in worship unless there's also social justice and active tenacious solidarity with the nobodies. Spirituality and the holy life are inseparable from active solidarity with the poor, the nobodies, the abused and the marginalized. This is the big point Cogitosis wants to communicate in his theomythical life of Bridget. It's also a key point in, in the Hebrew Bible and the Christian scriptures. The second um, theme is caring solidarity with animals. Cogitosis has a number of animal stories. 
Bridget is frequently portrayed as practicing prayer. And in one story, she's in a trance, what Cogitosis described as her soul in celestial meditation. She puts a large amount of bacon beside her dog. And a month later, the bacon is still there intact. The dog is acclaimed by Bridget as a hero. In another story, a hunted wild boar joined her herd. She blessed it and it stayed, serving her tamely and humbly. In a most unlikely happening in normal life, wolves act as swine herds for her. Wild ducks came to her and she's described as feeling tenderness for some ducks. The animal stories in the life portray Bridget as having a very close relationship with animals. The animal theme is a familiar one in the lives of all Celtic saints. Wives and other hagiographers are making is the importance of compassion towards all of life, human and animate, something inherent in Buddhism, but not always in the history of Christianity. Bridget is portrayed as the compassionately concerned with the welfare and well-being of all life. In the Anthropocene era, where humans are responsible for the destruction of the environment and of biodiversity, Bridget's caring solidarity with humans and animals is pertinent. An anthropocentric view of life assumed that humans are in every way superior to all other forms of life and that nature and animals only and the pleasures of humans. It has been a worldview that has frequently led to abuse of animals and cruelty justified by a human right, even a God-given right to dominate everything. So we've moved away from that view and we're now living in this Anthropocene era where we recognise we've got it wrong and that in fact we have a responsibility for all of life. Cogitosis's theomythical stories are a reminder that humans are not at the centre of the world. Humans are at the, not at the top of a bio ladder. Humans have ethical responsibilities to care for the animal world and the whole community of life. More than that, the God-inspired life, the practice of spirituality, living ethically, it involves kinship and friendship and partnership with all of creation. And finally, Bridget and living beyond patriarchy. There were many hagiographers who had written lives of saints, but there's no evidence that any of them was a woman. This anomaly, even though there were monastic communities of women and double or mixed communities, which were places of learning and compassionate service to the wider communities in which they were, was a very significant leader in the early Celtic communities. That's around 450 to 524. But there's no known surviving document that has been signed off by a woman. Lives were written later. Bridget's life by cogitosis is written, as Johnson stated earlier, um, 100 to 150 years later. And the seeming lack of women writers may reflect the growing patriarchy in the Irish church, as well as beyond Ireland. The Western church came to be hit by a negative attitude towards women, and women in leadership was not acceptable. A pope had already decided that Junia, the woman apostle in Romans 16, was not a woman at all, as women could not be apostles. So Junia was changed to Junius, a masculine male name. It's now known that Greek had no male name Junius. It never existed. But Junia, the leading woman apostle and church leader, was eliminated. She was deleted from scriptures for centuries. The Bible has been changed again, and Junia has been restored and liberated from gross patriarchal injustice. The lives do portray Bridget in a struggle with patriarchy. There are sexual politics at play in Bridget's relationship with the male saints, Patrick and Brendan. There's no historical basis for the three ever meeting. But the stories told show us a power struggle over primacy and ecclesial politics, 
and also a window into the gender struggles and sexual politics of the time. The events may not be historical, but the patriarchy and the gender politics are historical. We see this story with the Irish life of Bridget Dawes. Both lives do mention McKeel, M-A-C-C-A-I-L-L-E, a pupil of Bishop Mel. A veil was placed in Bridget's head and she, was he and she held the ash beam that supported the altar. The wood was not consumed by fire. What happened next was denied or repressed by ecclesial authorities. The paragraph from the Irish Life reads, The bishop, being intoxicated with the grace of God there, did not know what he was reciting from his book, for he consecrated Bridget with the orders of a bishop. Only this virgin in the whole of Ireland will hold Episcopal ordination, said Mel. While she was being consecrated, a fiery column ascended from her head. End quote. A bishop having drunk too much beer, not aware of what he was doing, and limiting Episcopal ordination to Bridget only, indicates an uneasiness with the practice. Historically, there's nothing to indicate that Bridget or any other woman at the time was ordained or could have been ordained a bishop. Bridget as a bishop is very difficult to reconcile with what we do know of women in the Irish church and elsewhere and of the early second century suppression of women as leaders of the church, already indicated in the pastoral letters, one and two, which are early second century writings included in the Christian Testament. Yet the story is in the Irish life. But why was it put there? Not necessarily as an historical event, but a monk giving us an insight into the complex and contradictory ideas about gender conflict in Irish society and church. The story reflects gender dynamics and gender politics. The theomythical life of Bridget shows the struggle to live beyond patriarchy. Cogitosis does tell a story of a male hermit who might rule the church with her in Episcopal dignity. But who is Episcopal dignity? the hermits or Bridget's? And what do we make of his reference to their Episcopal and feminine see? We're still struggling with gender equality and issues in church and society. Patriarchy is a stubborn issue. It's a significant part of institutional ethos and a structural injustice. If world peace also depends on peace between the sexes, then we need a justice ethic which demands living beyond patriarchy. The flame of justice symbolized for the fiery column ascending from Bridget's head following her Episcopal ordination, and the flame said to burn eternally at Kildare, is a sign of Bridget's solidarity with the poor and the struggle to overcome patriarchy. Poverty and patriarchy remain as twin structural and institutional blocks to a peaceful world and a common good. So that, that's the end of Johnson's presentation. And then there are two questions that he suggested we look at. And uh, I, they're, they're now in the uh, chat function. I'll just read them for you. And it's really a case of opening the, the discussion up. Hopefully we'll be able to hear each other. Uh, the first question, Cogitosis' life of Bridget highlighted the importance of compassion for the poor and justice for all living things. How important is this emphasis for how we live our lives today? Why do institutional churches still struggle with patriarchy? What needs to change to live beyond patriarchy? There's quite a lot packed into those, those few pages. So you might want to comment on what you've heard, or you might want to make a, a comment on, on either of the two questions. Uh, and it's really over to yourselves, and I'll try and facilitate the discussion.